He is one of the best real estate broker that I know. He was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, and has been in the real estate business for over 25 years. He is a full-time realtor and the vice president for the board of directors of the Greater Boston Associations of Realtors. He has many certifications in the real estate field. He is a certified negotiation specialist, an accredited buyer representative, new home specialist, and an international luxury home specialist. He is also a member of the National Association of Realtors, the Massachusetts Association of Realtors, the Greater Boston Real Estate Board, and the Real Estate Buyers Agents Council. Melvin is a true force of nature. He is one of the best real estate brokers in the United States, based in Massachusetts. In this interview, he clearly explains the steps to be taken when buying a property. And he also gives greater advice on how to become a real estate agent. Here is the knowledgeable Melvin Vieira on the Barry Media Show. Thank you very much for sparing your time for this interview, Mr. Vera. Thank you. You are a realtor and have been working in the greater Boston area and suburbs for many years. You also hold many positions in the real estate fields. Can you provide us with some background, please? Thank you, Barry, for um, actually holding this interview with me. And I appreciate it. Should I say this podcast or video cast, if you want to say. Um, matter of fact, I've been selling real estate for about 30 years. I've uh, been licensed in California as well as Massachusetts. The crazy thing about it is I started selling real estate in California first and then moved back to Boston, even though I am from Boston. Um, I started selling real estate, uh, beachfront property in Manhattan and most of Redondo Beach. Uh, from there, um, I came back to Boston. And when I came back to Boston, um, I came back in the actual early 90s, mid 90s around there. I came back after a lot of things that happened in California, but see, the funny thing is California went into a recession after the East Coast did. Um, they were, they, it happened in second. So I got caught in that wave of the first actual recession. So I've been through two depressions or two recessions, should I say, in the real estate economy. Um, so when I came back to Boston, I started uh, looking around and figuring out how can I make a true impact in the business? And what I did was I realized that I needed to um, do some things that were a little bit different than most. And I had to look at and see how I could help out my community where I grew up in, but also help out others, but also teach them a thing, a certain things that I know, the knowledge about real estate. And I looked for a couple of venues. And one of the first venues that I started off with about 18, actually 19 years ago, was called Maha, Massachusetts Housing Alliance. Then from there, um, I turned around and got uh, introduced to New Waster, Urban Edge, uh, Watch All, um, so South, South Shore, um, home, South Shore, it's called, now called South Shore Neighborhood Neighbor Works um, in Foxborough. I went to a place down there, went out a place in Woburn. I've done things all over teaching, teaching first time home buyer classes. But I didn't do it on my own. I worked with an actual organizations that were actually putting it on and actually had the people who came who wanted to obtain a certificate or obtain knowledge about the industry, um, or should I say about how to buy a home. So what I did was I started teaching classes there. Um, and then from there, um, I sat on the board of Carbon Square NBC. I also sat on the board of YES Youth Enrichment Services, where I learned to ski at age 12, where I took kids skiing in that organization and took the, inner, the kids from the inner city, taking them out skiing and introducing them to the mountains. Um, so I did that as well. And that was all the things that I kind of put together. And I started looking at all the organizations that I was a part of. How could I connect them all? And how could I really do what I do in, in the industry of real estate and make sure they all work together? And I realized that by me affecting these young men and women, number one, I realized that their, their, their parents, I could meet their parents and I could also tell the parents what I did for a living. 
but then also by me sitting on the board of Cartman Square in DC, by me in the community, I started learning about what these NDCs and CDCs actually do, which are known as community development corps or neighborhood development corps, what they do within the community. So I got that great understanding grasp of how they affected the communities and how they made changes in the communities and what things I could do being a real estate agent and also using my influence and explain to them that this may be a great idea, this may be not a great idea, maybe we could look at it like this. So I was able to give a different perspective on that piece. So I was able to know that when I was working with the kids, a lot of those kids came from those communities that I was actually on the CDCs and NDCs and helping out. But also when I was teaching the first time home buyer classes, I also realized a lot of those kids were coming, their parents were, you know, who came to these to, to take their kids to go skiing and learn. They wanted to learn how to buy a home. So I introduced them to a lot of these other um, organizations that taught the first time home buyer. So I looked at the complete synergy of how it all worked. Then from there, Barry, what I also realized was, you know, I needed to do something else. And about six years ago, um, I, you know, was made a leap onto the Greater Boston Board of Realtors as a board of director. Um, I sat on there, and what I realized was how the real estate agents, um, and I always knew this because I was a realtor always anyway, but my point is I also realized that how the Greater Boston Board of Realtors was actually affecting the agent, educating the agent, and helping shape them to become a better agent. And that really inspired me because I wanted to make sure that my fellow real estate agents, fellow realtors were better than the used car salesperson. So I decided to get a part of the board and I started moving up throughout the board. I've taken on many positions on the board, Barry. I've actually now ended up as the vice president of the Greater Boston Board of Realtors. But meanwhile, in my steps, I had to be on the board of directors. And then from there, I had to move up and be that became a treasurer. And then from a the treasurer, I became the vice president. But besides that, I was also on a lot of subcommittees or committees as well. I was on the diversity committee um, in regards to an inclusion committee. Um, I was also on the uh, membership committee. I was, I was on the government affairs. We we're learning about the politics and stuff that takes place with inside how to buy a home or basically the legislation that the state's trying to put on if they're trying to do green or, or if they're trying to do energy, you know, green for energy scoring or if they're trying to propose a certain tax, transfer tax, CPA tax, all those things that go on and, and, and a lot more. I also have the honor also because the National Association of Realtors has bestowed this upon me to be, be called what they call the Federal Political Coordinator. I am the Federal Political Coordinator for Iona Presley. So uh, anything that comes from the Greater Boston Board of Realtors, or should I say from the National Association, which is down through to the Greater Boston to me, um, I then, if they have any kind of legislative issues or whatever that they're looking at Congress, they want Congress to possibly look at to either you know, think if think in favor of it or why would why would we oppose it or why we're for it. I actually bring this information to her chief of staff and to her to her staff and let them know and I ask them to disseminate that information onto her so she can make an informed decision. I also do proposals and I shouldn't say proposals, I actually do work workbooks for her and also I've done it for Russell Holmes, I've done it for Sonia D. H. And a few other people. I do workbooks. So what happens? I let them know what's going on inside their community in regards to the demographics of how many, you know, um, what what's the average income, you know, where what how many how many actual uh, stores type of stores they have in their district and all those things. So they can look at that because I have that access at my fingertips to present to them. So the funny thing is, Barry, is that I've been able to do a lot of different things, which has made me into who I am today. And it's also allowed me now to become a better realtor in regards to this because then I can help out the fellow client and help, help my fellow agent out and make us all better people in this industry. So I hopefully that sums up a lot. Oh, yeah. That sums up a lot. Absolutely. What prompted you into real estate? Well, Barry, you know, the funny thing is um, I, I, well, my, my father, he sold real estate as well in Massachusetts, but that really didn't prompt me. Um, I knew what he did, but. Um, I moved to California, and I, I was, when I was at Howard University, I was in a labor union. And the funny thing about it was, because being a labor union, the unions are actually, you know, nationwide. So, you know, I was able to take my union card and transfer it to California. So I was actually, when I moved out to California, I was like, hey, you know what? I can make more money working in construction and, you know, using my education. So I started doing that. And I was working one day, and one day I'm driving down Pacific Coast Highway, and I'm looking around, and I'm going wow, look at that, look at that, what's that, and how much does that go for? And people are like, well, that goes for a million dollars, that goes for 500,000, and I'm scratching my head going, hold on, back in Boston, 
the homes weren't going for that money. They were going for twenty five to a hundred thousand dollars, maybe three hundred thousand max. I'm like, what the? So I said, well, let me ask you a question. How much does it cost to build those things? And they gave me a number, and I was like, oh, okay. So I said, maybe I could, now that I know the construction piece that I've been in, there, let me, maybe I can be a builder. But I said to myself, I can't stop building a product for an area that I don't know. So I had to educate myself. So I said, the quickest way for me to educate myself is to get my real estate license. I went and got my real estate license. From there, I sold real estate in California. And um, the funny thing about it is I, I worked for a company called Century 21 Coast Properties, where I don't tell a lot of people this, but I was um, in the top, uh, should I say, top 21 for, for Century 21 in the Los Angeles area as far as sales volume. Um, and I was very fortunate, and, and I, I, I did that by a lot of hard work, cold calling, door knocking, and, and basically you know, I was doing over 100 cold calls a day, calling the expires and all those things. So you say to me, what prompted me to get in that business? And, and that was because of that, seeing those buildings and seeing anything, but then for me to raise to the level that I raised to, that I was able to do that, um, was because of the hard work I put into it. And then, you know, Barry, I, I moved back here and I kind of summed it up what I was doing when I moved back here. So, you know, that's what prompted me to get into it. So I heard you talking about realtor. I also heard you talking about real estate license. So what is the difference between a realtor and a real estate agent? So you, you asked me, what is the difference? Well, um, Barry, I just so happen to have a, a, a little bag here with me. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that when you're a realtor, you actually will have a pin, okay? The, the R, the R will go and be put right on your lapel and you walk around. And you ask, what, what's a realtor? A realtor is in, a, is, is, in the beautiful thing is the National Association of Realtors has come up with a campaign of, called Who We Are. And that campaign of Who We Are is basically selling people why I'm a realtor. I'm gonna read this real quick to you. It says, I'm a realtor. And I pledge myself to strive to be honorable and to abide by the golden rule, to strive and serve well my, my community through it, my country, to abide, my real, to abide the realtor's code of ethics and strive to conform my conduct to its aspirational ideas, to act honestly in all real estate dealings, to protect the individual rights of real estate ownership and to widen the opportunity to enjoy it, to seek a better representation uh, to my clients and build my knowledge and competency. That's what it means to be a realtor. Really, the code of ethics has, ha, has us at another level. I'm not saying that there is no code of ethics in being a real estate agent, but when you're a realtor, you have another set of code of ethics that is unbelievable. The funny thing is, Barry, that people don't even realize that the the, the, the United States of America does not and did not have the LBGTQ piece inside the equal rights inside of their and their piece of equal rights to buy or home ownership. And the funny thing is, we as realtors already inputted that, and that's been inside of our language. So we were holding ourselves at a higher level than even the United States government was. And that's the thing about being a realtor. We hold ourselves at a higher level. Ironically, the, the Congress has finally inserted that word in there, and it has passed, and it will be part of the doctrine going forward. But we actually pushed for that last year. So you ask, what is a realtor? That's what a realtor is. Holding yourself at a higher level and belonging to an association that respects the industry and is there to help the people. Barry, you can still buy and sell homes as a real estate agent. I mean, you can still do those things. I mean, you can sell homes and you know, help them, whatever. But the thing is, is that we're held at a certain standard of a code of ethics. Okay, we're held at a higher level. And that is for the consumer's best interest. Not saying that the real estate agent isn't. Okay, and not saying they can't serve you. And there are some great real estate agents, but the problem that they don't understand is the power of the R and what the R actually does. That R actually, we are the, the largest lobbying organization, okay, in, in the United States. We're larger than and, and basically everybody. We are the, we're the largest. So I'll just say this that anything that goes on, anything that happens, buying, selling homes, commercial, residential, whatever it may be. 
if there's an issue, we're the ones who are at the forefront trying to make a change and make a difference to make sure that home ownership stays number one. And it's that, that is a right and it's not taken away from the consumer. But the real estate agent gains the benefit of us because we're not going to exclude the real estate agent and we're not going to exclude the consumer, but we're going to make sure that we are we're keeping that level at a high, high, high level. Do you need a real estate license to flip houses? You don't need a real estate license to flip houses, Barry. Um, you know, flipping houses, it, 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 every, HGTV, I say, has ruined a lot of this because what happens is, you know, in, within 30 minutes to an hour, all of a sudden, someone's bought the house, fixed it up, and sold it. So everybody thinks that's what happens, but people don't understand it's called the magic of TV. TV has distorted a lot and made people think they can get rich. Don't get me wrong. There have been a lot of successful people who have done it, but they will also tell you that they've had a lot of failures along the way. The thing is that they never tell you about the failures. Um, I always tell a lot of my friends and people who come to me and tell me, do me a favor. If you're going to be a house flipper, don't have your real estate license. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And I say, do you understand once you have your real estate license and if anything goes wrong with that transaction, you're known, you're also now held at a different level because you actually have what they think you have on, omnipotent. You have a knowledge that's higher than the next and that consumer. It's not saying that you don't have that knowledge because you flipped that house as a regular Joe, but once you have that license, you just held yourself. So if anything goes wrong, so I always say to you, tell people all the time, is this. You're going to do it, get a real estate agent in the middle of it. You always want to have buffers when you're doing, if you're thinking about flipping, meaning the liability actually comes off of you. If you have the, uh, if you have a lawyer involved in the transaction, a real estate agent involved in the transaction, your lender's involved, but when it's just you, there's, you're not insulated, okay? And then you have other people who can help you think and help you come come up with creative ideas with marketing because you, know, you may think you know the best way to market a home or sell a home. That's not your job. Your job is to fix the home. Your job is to listen to your people around you who can tell you what's best to put in that home to make that home better. So flipping is there. People do well. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of ups and downs in it. And, and But you got to find that sweet spot. The sad part about Barry is a lot of people think right now that they can still flip homes, which they can. But what they're looking for is that outrageous profit. That outrageous profit is ridiculous. People now are thinking they can still make that 50% profit. They really can't do that anymore because of what people are selling the, the property for and what they put into it. You know, I always tell people, good measures, if you can, if you can scrape off 20% off that property, congratulations, keep it going and be happy. Because if you can scrape off 20%, let's say that 20% is $100,000. And if you can do, let's just say, you can do 10 of them a year. What's that? It's a million dollars. Okay, if you do five of them, it's 500,000. That's much more than the most average income. Yes, you gotta pay taxes on that, or if you do a 1031 tax exchange and all those other different things to go ahead and offset your gains, um, then there's a whole other thing. But that's where it comes down to having your real estate agent, having your CPA, having your lawyer involved to understand what you can do with your money once you make your profit. So what is your experience like being in this field for, for these many years? You know, Barry, every time I think in this business and all the years that I've been doing it, that I always think to myself, have I seen it all? I haven't. You know, just recently, something just happened to me just recently that I had to laugh and, and, and I had to, you know, do something about it. But every time in this business, this business always changes. So, yes, a lot of transactions will be very, very similar but then the transactions can change throughout and you can go through a regular sale where it just goes through very easy where the buyer comes in, seller comes in, they sell, the lender comes in, gets approved and closes. Okay. Yeah. You still have to get the final water. You have to get the final smoke. Okay. And you have to go ahead and make sure there's no liens in it. Well, you don't make sure the attorney makes sure there's no liens in coming. So you got to make sure the title insurance happens, all those other things, make sure the buyer gets approved. That's the natural course of a real estate transaction. But there are so many other different things that can happen during that time. It can even happen before you even sell the property. I'm talking about when you first list the home and how to, how to, 
how to maintain and how to control the seller and educating the seller that the market is changing and why the market's changing. And if you can't articulate that to the seller of why the market's changing and what's happened, then in turn, you're not doing your job. So you as the agent needs to be able to articulate that back to your, 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 your seller or should I say the consumer and the market has changed and, and the, the industry has changed in many different ways as far as prices going up, prices going down. Um, very, I, there, there's so many different things that I can, I, I can talk about as far as, you know, the, the, the different laws uh, in regards to, you know, to how you can transfer the home, what kind of mortgage goes for certain things. We talk about the different types of uh, recording fees and, 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 just giving a final water to, to, to give the final smoke to just, just coming down to the closing table and understanding that perspective. So it has changed in the way that offers are written or the contracts are written. Um, there's a lot of differences. It seems like you have a, a, a well of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I have. So let me ask you though. Pull it so out, pull it when out. someone wants to get like all these information, they can go on your website, right? Yes, they can. And they can just contact. What's your, what's your website again? My website is, you have a couple of them. I have www.thepropertiesforsaleinboston.com. I also have www.thevieragroup.com. Um, and then I also have uh, www.melvinaviarejr.com. But the best ones is www.propertiesforsaleinboston.com or www.thevieragroup. Um, is that. I also have a Brookline one. I have a few different ones, but those are the main ones. I see. Great information. All right. Now let's talk about the buyer. Okay. The buyer? Yeah. Oh, the, oh, the buyer. Oh, that's right. The buyer is part of this whole transaction. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's talk about the buyer. So before buying a house or a property, what are the first things one needs to know about the house they are buying? I, I don't even want to go with that question first, Barry. We'd love to go, what does the buyer need to do before the buyer can even get started? How's that? And then we'll talk about sure, that. Sure, absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that, that's, that's great too. Like, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, go for it. So the buyer, number one, needs to know a couple of things. They need to know why are they making this move and what, what is driving them to do this. Okay, that's the number one. Figure out that. Now, is it that they that's one of their goals and their aspirations? Um, they need to figure out from there. Once they figured out why they're doing it, they need to figure out, you know, what can they afford and how can they put themselves in the best position to be able to buy the home? Meaning, do they have to clear some debt? Do they have to save up some money? Is there programs out there? for them to go ahead and for down payment assistance. Now there are different types of loan programs like FHA, MFHA, um, is it the one program is, is, you know, there's a bunch of things they need to also figure out there. But so I always say to a lot of first time buyers is make sure you go to a first time home buyer class. If you take it online or find a place that actually teaches it. So you can get the background and working knowledge of what they need to do to prepare themselves because people don't understand Barry, let me ask you a quick question here, and you'll 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 appreciate this, Barry. If you're going to California, what what will you do? I need a map. I need a I need a GPS. There something. you go. Yeah. So guess what? I need every buyer to figure out and get a GPS or a map. I need them to figure out what direction they're going. So I need them to write down their goals. Okay. I need them to then turn around and list out exactly the steps that they're going to go and do to buy a home. So the first step is to figure out where they want to be, okay, and figure out the reason is. Then I need them to write down, you know, if they need them to go check on their credit and check on other things. Then what I need them to do from that point is then stop looking in different areas in the areas that they wish they could be and live in. From that next step, what I need them to do is that I need them to figure out what kind of style of home that they would like. So if they want a, if they want a condo, I want a multifamily, single family, whatever they kind of think in the back of their head, okay? Then I need them to pick out two different styles of homes, okay? Because the reason being, because in one area, they may not afford that type of home in that one area, but they could afford a two-family in that, or a three-family in that area, but they couldn't afford a single family. Then what I need them to do is then stop, then figure out that. Then I need them also go online and go on Google and Google Maps. I want them to look at where they work. Then what I want them to do is I want them to turn around 
and figure out from where they were to where they want to move. I want them to look at Google Maps and look at how long that commute possibly could be. I need them also to check out to see if there's any kind of local transportation or anything in that area that they can use to get back and forth to work just in case they can't use their car. Then I need them to look at and see if there's any kind of hospitals or any kind of pharmacies or anything in those areas, okay? I need them to check all those things out. I need them also if they have young kids, look for daycare, look for all those things because, or, or see where their parents live or, or family members because they may have to drop those kids off to those people because they may need help in that time. Or they may also be taking care of elderly. So they've got to figure out what their commute's going to be back and forth to take care of that elderly. Once they figured all that out, and if those things don't weigh heavy on them, then they can say, okay, this doesn't bother me. This does, this does. Now, once they figured all that out, then in turn, I need them to do some deep, deep research. Okay. I need them to figure out, you know, in that area, who can they get to help them walk them through this most important purchase of their life. And that means they need to find a real estate agent, a real tour who can help them find that, okay? So the way they do that is they have a several ways of doing that. Number one, what they can do, Barry, is they can turn around and they can literally go online like everybody else and go to Zillow and go to all these sites and figure it out, okay? But that's not the proper way to do it. Because you could get anybody and anything, anybody can do anything online if they know how to manipulate it. My thing is at that point is you should look at that. But then what you also do then is you start asking around to other people about who have you used. Then once you figured out who they've used, you then turn around. At that point is you take the people who you found possibly online, you found the people they've used, and I want you to do an interview process, interviewing process. And I want you to ask them certain questions. And the question, the main question I want them to ask is, hey, will you have my best interest at heart when it comes down to doing this job? The first thing they should say is yes. But then they go, yeah, I will. And they go, no, no, no. And then you say, ask them a hiker question. Listen, it's not, I hope this is not about the commission to you. If this is about the commission to you and not about my best interest, I do not want to work with you. A lot of times you'll get the ones say, well, yeah, and they start, and they start hesitating. I want you to put, put your guard up. Then I want you to turn around, Barry. I want them to turn around, Barry. Then really start drilling down and asking other key questions. Do you know the area? Um, how long have you been in the business? Do you, do you understand the rules and regs of, 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 of the area? Do you understand? Uh, do, do, you, do, do, you, do you know certain things? And if they say, well, I don't know this, I don't know this, I don't know this, don't fire them, don't get rid of them. What you need to do is turn to them and say, do you have a mentor or do you have a manager who's been helping you out? And if they say yes, you say, great, I'm glad you do. Can I talk to your manager or your mentor? Once you, as the consumer, talk to the manager and mentor, you should get a good feeling about who that manager and mentor is. What I will also tell them to do is what you want to do is you want to from either the person you're talking to or to the manager or mentor, get three recommendations from them of people they may know. I want you to take those three recommendations and pick up the phone. Listen, when you go for a job, Barry, what do they do? They interview you, okay? And then what they do is they ask for three recommendations. You don't think they call, they do call. So why don't you call for the person who's handling the most important purchase of your life? This is what I tell the consumer. At that point, Barry, at that point, is when they make an informed decision of who that person is. If they want to meet the person in person, feel free to do that. And once you meet them. Also, I tell people a lot of times, do not get scared or afraid because the person is at a certain level of, and you think in their industry or their business, that they can't help you. Okay, don't think, oh, they're not going to want to deal with me at a $300,000 piece of property. Understand, they could have never got to that level unless they helped out those people at that level. Okay. And you're going to come across a lot of people who have what they call teams. And teams are good. And as long as the, you know, you know, the team member and the team is doing right and they understand the rules and the regulations and the laws and they can help you, they can do a great job. So, Barry, when you ask that question, what do you do when you first get to the house? That's before the house, okay? Those are important steps that you make. Now, when you get to that house, with that agent who you find, the most important thing I want you to do is I want you to get outside the car and look at the house. I want you to look around the house. I want you to look up and down the street. But even before that, Barry, 
before you even got to the house, you should have gone on Google Earth and you should have walked up and down that street at night on your laptop on Google Earth. Because you can go in the backyards, you can go around up and down the street, you can see what's basically going on. So when you get there, you're kind of familiar with the area. Then at that point, when you're outside that house, you're looking around, I want you to look at the roof. You may not know anything about the roof. I want you to look at the windows, I want you to look at the, the siding, I want you to look at the stairs. You may not know anything about it. You may see something lifting up. You may see something turn, torn, whatever. I don't want you to use that to discount the house. I just want you to keep in mind that that's what's going on. Then I want you to walk in the house. When you walk in the house, I don't want, and I hate when the listing agent is in the house. The listing agent should never, ever, ever, ever be in the house. And this is my per se, this is my feeling, is because what happens, the buyer cannot feel open. The buyer cannot feel like they can try on the house. But you know, that's where your real estate agent comes in. Your real estate agent is not a home inspector. And please remember that. But your real estate agent should be able to point out a lot of things to you that you may not see because you, the consumer, is going through the home just looking at it, Barry, as just a home. You're looking at it, can you see yourself living there and let your family live there? The key thing, Barry, is they got to go through that home and try that home on. And your agent should say, hey, look at that, look at this, look at this. Well, let me find out. Let me find out if this has been fixed. Let me find out what's been going on. So I'll find out the age of the heating system nine times out of ten. It's inside the MLS. If the age of the heating system may or may not be there. Sometimes the water heaters may be in there. The age of it, if it's been updated electrical, all those things. Your agent can get those answers. If they can't get it, they'll go back to the listing agent afterwards and email or call the listing agent and say, hey, listen, I have some certain questions. What's going on in this house? Do you know about this? Do you know about that? Do you know about this? Then that agent can bring back some uh, bring back a, 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 some information to you as the consumer to help you make an informed decision on making a purchase on the home. So, you know, Barry, that, that's your, that summarizes a lot. But, you know, Barry, this is the other thing I got to tell people. Please don't tell me that your bed is a king size or a queen size bed or a full size bed. I need you to tell me what size or how big your bed is, how many inches it actually is. The reason why I say that, Barry, is I hate when people walk into a home and tell me, oh, Melvin, my bed won't fit there. And I go, well, how big is your bed? They don't realize the king size bed is one size, but the, what I'm talking about, the furniture the bed actually fits in, actually adds on inches or takes away, depending on how it sets, it fits. The, the bureaus, the, the couches, all those things are important. And I tell people all the time, I go, if you don't have a tape measure, use your arm. Okay, you your feet are tape measures. Okay, so walk off your furniture and know how many paces it takes and how big your bed is by the paces that you've taken. Does that make sense, Barry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's important. So, th so, so there, so there, there we go. And then if you get all that information, then you can make an informed decision to make an offer. Great. So now my question is that now you get all that right. You got, you found the place that you like, you know, you went through everything you just described. Now you find the, you found the perfect house. You see yourself living in this house with your family uh, for the rest of your life. What are the different steps involved in getting that property? So you're saying if you like the property, you want to make an offer. That's what you're basically asking. Correct. Okay, so the, the first thing I need you to do is make sure that when you're making an offer, make sure you have a pre-approval letter, okay, which comes from the lender. That's the reason why I talked about that lender earlier. All right, that's number one. I need to make sure that's on hand in your file. Number two, make sure you have a check. A check. It's important because you need some kind of compensation in the state of Massachusetts to pass across the table to make it a legal and binding contract. Also, I want you to have understanding working knowledge from that agent, what that actual offer contract looks like, so you're not afraid when you go ahead and sign it. Also understand and make sure the agent has already given you up front what they call the Massachusetts Agency Disclosure, um, which tells you how the agent is actually working for you. Then when you have all those things put together, the agent will then construct the offer for you and put down the terms and conditions that you would like. And then once that is done, that agent then will take that offer and submit it to the actual listing agent or to whatever entity it may be. It may be a foreclosed REO company, whatever it may be. They'll submit it to that company or to that agent. That agent nine times out of 10 has what they call uh, telling you, look, it's going to take me 24 hours before I can get back to you or I have multiple offers and I'm going to, reach, I'm going to respond to all offers at a certain time and date. 
So let's just say that there is no other offers. You're the eight, you're the buyer, you come in, the eight, the seller then we can, can counter back and forth. When the seller counters back and forth with you at a certain price, you, the buyer or the consumer, will decide if that's the price you want to settle on. Once you have agreed upon that price, what will happen is then you have the opportunity to do what they call an inspection at that time. Um, at that time, the inspection, and you get a home inspector. The home inspector will then walk through the home with you. Please mind you that the, the initial deposit you put up will have to be given to the actual listing office to be held in escrow. At the, at, that's prior to the home inspection. At the home inspection, in turn, the home inspector will go through and look and see if there's any kind of defects or anything going on in the home. Once, this, once the home inspector turns around and says, okay, these are the issues of the home, you have the right to either ask the seller to correct them or you may say, forget it, I will correct them myself. Or you can negotiate in the price and terms and say, listen, Mr. Seller, I need you to fix this, but I also need you to reduce this. Mr. Seller, I need you to do this, do this, this, and I'll buy it at this price. If you and the seller do not come to an agreement, then what happens is that you will sign off and do a release and say a release for a release because home the terms cannot be agreed upon during the home inspection. I want my deposit back. But if you both agree, then you then you you will have your attorney because you'll have your attorney involved. Your attorney then will then get through the uh, purchase and sales agreement and that attorney, your attorney will then reach out to the sell, well, the sales attorney will reach out to your attorney and they will come to what they call a mutually agreed upon purchase and sales agreement, which was better known as a PNS. At that time, that PNS then will be done. That is actually a more concrete information, uh, a little more detailed than the offer is. It may seem very scary because it ends up to like eight, nine pages, but then you'll sign that. Then you have to bring in another um, deposit in, which is called the signing of the money, deposit for purchase and sales agreement. That money will then go in. Then what happens at that point is uh, once that money is put in, then that purchase and sales agreement is then given to your lender. Your lender then will take that. Once your lender takes that, your lender then will go ahead and uh, submit that to the bank along with the loan application that you have submitted to your bank. Then that all the information will go to underwriting. Underwriting then will go ahead and go through all the information and ask you, the buyer, a lot of information. They will turn around and ask you for, you know, almost like your, your firstborn. You'll be scratching your head like, wow, they want that letter for this. They want this. I don't get this whole thing. But believe me, it's a process. But it's a process put in place to protect you, the consumer, to make sure you're not falsifying, but also to make sure that you are worthy and able to buy this and not default on your on the loan. At that point... What happens is then the, then the appraisal will also go up. When the appraisal goes up, the appraisal will check to make sure that what you're buying the property for at that value is the proper value. If it's higher or lower, nine times out of 10, the appraiser comes in at that value. But if they find it to be a lower value, they will come in at a lower value. And, and they don't normally go over the higher value, even when the neighborhood may be higher, but they'll come in close to that value. So if the value is lower, then you go back to the seller and say to the seller, listen, I would love for you, I'd love to buy your home, but the value your home is at this value. We need to come to this value. Now the seller has a couple of choices. The seller either has the right to turn around and say, fine, I will lower the value. Or the seller may say, hell no, I don't want to do that. And the seller may walk away and, and blow, the, blow the whole deal up. Or the seller may say to you, the consumer, or should I say the buyer, look, I'm willing to still sell this house to you but you have to add in the extra money to make a difference. Now you have your couple of choices there. So if you decide, okay, one of the choices you go through, then, then you go back to the lender, the lender then turns around and says, great. The lender then go, works through all the details, looks make sure everything's right. The lender then sends you what they call a commitment letter. You get the commitment letter. On the listing agent side, their job is to make sure they get the final water and the final smoke. Okay, certificates meaning the home is certified. You look at the fire department, make sure that all proper equipment is inside the home working properly. And the final water is to make sure that, that the final water bill is taken care of. You as the consumer, or the buyer, should I say, your job is to make sure that at the end of the transaction, to make sure you turn the, turn the electricity on in your name, turn the water on on your name, turn the heat on on your name, and everything else. That is your job at that point. But why I go back a little further is that once the commitment is done, then you go to the closing table. Um, that happens naturally probably about seven days after the commitment. At that point, all that information, as I said, the final water and final smoke will be brought to the closing table. And then your attorney and the cell attorney will sit down, go over the docs that have been given to you by the bank. You'll look at them all. 
you sign those docs and it's a thick, thick piece, thick packet. Don't be intimidated by it. Go ahead, go through it. But if you have any questions, ask the questions, please go through because they are legal documents. Um, and then once you go through that, the most important piece of that whole mortgage is the note. Okay, look at the note. The note is what you actually say you're going to pay, how much you owe, and uh, how long you have to pay it, and what you got to do at certain times. And also the other piece that they give you is the actual where to send your statement or where to send your um, actual uh, payment to. That's another important piece. But once that's all done, then in turn, you actually own the home and you close. And at that point, then it's your home. The point is, is that, you know, there'll be some issues in the home and the home is not going to be perfect. Okay, even a brand new home, you're going to find a lot of things that are going on. So keep that in mind. I always tell people, a home is where you, a home, it, excuse me, a house is one thing, a home is another. A home is what you make it once you've moved in and added your touches. Okay, you've watched your family grow up. And a home is always going to change. There's always going to be maintenance that needs to be done to the home. So you have to be in, you have to be very attentive and you have to be willing to do the maintenance to the home. You cannot let the home just go down and dwindle because then the property value of the home will go down because the home has a lot of work that needs to be done. And guess what happens? At that point, when you decide to sell at that point, you're going to either have to get a lot of money to fix it up to bring it back up to the standards. But I always tell my clients, do work slowly. As you see something happen, do it. Okay? And don't think it needs to be done overnight, but get it done. But get it done within a timely manner. So the next thing that can go wrong doesn't happen because you neglected to do something else. Great information. So let me ask you, though, Mr. Vera, all of this that you just described, I know you live in Massachusetts. Is this applicable for any other, uh, is this applicable applicable to other states as well yes. like in the United States? Yes, it is. It's basically um, very similar, but certain states don't use attorneys. Certain states use escrow officers. Um, the contracts are a little bit different. Um, some people use what they call one pagers. Uh, some people go directly to purchase and sales agreement, um, but the process of where, and, and some people have the home inspection done earlier before you actually make an offer, but the basic premise and the process of you going through the steps of looking for a home and figuring out what you need to do and how you go about it, that's important, okay? The other stuff in the middle of who handles the transaction and details are a little bit different, but how it closes at the end is all the same. And it's important that you listen to that and understand. So the most important in this whole conversation is the beginning piece that I told you about what you need to do as a buyer and the end piece is what happens at the closing. Great. So there are people who like to buy foreclosed properties. The, the foreclosed properties barrier is not for the faint of heart. When I say that, it is for the person who understands what they're getting themselves into. Foreclosure sounds great because, oh, wow, I can get a good piece of property at a certain price. Well, the only reason why it's at that price because there's a lot of defects going on on the property. And Barry, you talk about foreclosure. There's also what they call short sales as well. And they kind of go hand in hand. And I'll kind of talk about both. Um, but foreclosed properties, um, basically, there's two different ways you can hear about a foreclosed property. Um, foreclosed property, you'll see, um, which basically the lender is foreclosing on and the lender basically is giving the seller opportunity to make their mortgage payments, but then have told them that, listen, if you can't make your mortgage payments after some we're going to default on your mortgage. Once they default on the mortgage, then in turn they go to the courts and they file um, a foreclosure notice and they petition. And the, once the courts execute the petition, they have the right then to do what they call an actual auction at this actual property at the site. Sometimes they will do the auction at the site and sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll just go ahead and say they're going to do an auction and then walk away and then just capture the property, meaning capture and bring it back into the bank's portfolio. Sometimes they'll do the auction because they think they can get more money for it and they will do it. So you'll see different things. But now a lot of times when the bank actually captures the property and brings it back into the portfolio, that's where that's when we have what we call REO agents, real estate um, owned real estate agents who actually are specialized and understand how to handle it. They'll bring it to market and put it on the multiple listing service and then try to sell it there. There's also so that's one way of so that's two ways of getting REOs. You can go to the auction. You can get it from the actual REO agent, 
okay, who's listing it, is another way where banks sometimes will take their REO properties and group them in a group. So if they own a bunch of REO properties throughout different areas, they'll group them in the middle. Let's, let's think they're putting it in one big bag and they'll look for some investor, some, some hedge fund, some REIT company, something and say, listen, I have a portfolio of these properties here. What do you want to do? You want to buy this portfolio? Now there's some good stuff and there's some bad stuff, of course. But I'm going to sell it to you for this number and we're going to be able to write it off on our books. I mean, the bank can write it off on their books once they've sold off that portfolio. And then what happens is those REIT or those hedge funds people will then take that property and they'll try to go ahead and market it with inside their group of people and then find individual investors in their portfolio and sell it to them or bring it to market and try to sell it themselves. So, and then, then that becomes another form of way these REO or REIT property or these properties come on market. So, so when you say REO, you mean repossessed properties, right? Well, yeah, they're called, yeah, well, you know, you know it as repossessed, but it's called real estate owned properties. Okay. Which is basically REO the same. It's, it's the acronyms are kind of saying repossessed REO, correct. Okay. So that's how that basically works. You know, so um, there, there's different levels. Now, when I talk about short sales, I kind of mentioned that to you. Short sales were really, really big um, back in the, like I said, I've been through two downturns in the market. Um, and the first downturn, our short sales and REOs were a little bit easier. We didn't have to go through all the bureaucracy. There was just a couple of people there who made decisions. Now that the market changed back in 2008, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, there was a lot of short sales out there. So the short sales were when people were defaulting on the mortgages. So when back in the day when they had that, what they call predatory lending, when they were lending money to certain places where people were getting stuff for no money down, those people were, uh, because, they, because their mortgages ballooned and they had what they call an acceleration clause, they couldn't make the payments anymore. So because they couldn't make the payments, the lender came in and captured the property. And when the lender came to caps the property, they told the consumer, hey, look, you can do one of two things. You can do a short sale or we capture it and we make it, we turn it as a real estate owned piece of property. So if you do a short sale, it means that you bring in all your documentation and they offer them two choices, either they call a loan modification or a short sale. Loan modification took a long time to go through. And ironically, the funny thing is that people were doing loan modification, but they were also trying, they, they weren't doing a short sale option. And the bank was doing a foreclosed option. So the loan modification was going on, the short and the foreclosure option was going on. They're going hand, they're going together. But all of a sudden, because the modification took forever, they foreclosed on the property and took it from them. So what I was walking into a lot of situations because I because the beautiful thing is when I was teaching these first time home buyer classes for a lot of these organizations, they also had a foreclosure or REO or uh, or, or loan modification division. And I would go to them and say, listen, I know you can't give me the clients directly, but I know you have the right to offer three different real estate agents. Please put my name out there because I understand how to make this help, help them in a better light. So what we did was we turned around and you're going to love this. I would go ahead and say, okay, you're a loan modification. Great. But we need to do a short sale at the same time. The same paperwork you're giving for the loan modification, we use the same paperwork for the short sale. So this way here, they're doing, so the bank's doing the foreclosure on you. You're trying to do a modification. We'll do a short sale. So we have three things working. One, two things are positive for us. The other one is for them. Let's see if we can get ahead of this. So what they would do is they'd have to submit all this information. They'd have to submit a budget. They'd have to submit their tax returns, a letter of explanation of what's going on and why they fell in this position. They'd submit all this information. And what happens is then we'd have to go back and forth. The lender would send out what they call BPO, broker price opinions, and send appraisers out to figure out the value. Then I'd have to justify the value and justify the cause of why they were in this position. There were some other things that we had to do on top of it, but once we did that, we were able to make that work. So why I say all that to you, Barry, is that they, then what happens, the bank would agree to sell it at a certain number of the short sale, and then there'd be an excess number above, and that number, what happened was because when Barack Obama was in office, um, he started what they call the Debt Forgiveness Act. The Debt Forgiveness Act has been extended so far, thank God, through Congress and the state Senate for those who are still in trouble. What happens is that above money then gets written, given to them as a 1099, but what happens is the IRS will then give what they call debt forgiveness to them so they wouldn't get taxed on it and would not be part of the tax basis for that year. 
The beautiful thing is a lot of people right now who did those short sales back in 2008, 2009, 11, 12 are actually entering back in the market right now, able to buy because they've been able to build their credit back up and get themselves back in position. So it's not like an end all be all that if you do a short sale that you can't buy. Even a foreclosure, there have been people who've done foreclosures who've been able to get back. As a matter of fact, I just helped a young lady last year buy a place. She was able to buy something because doing something. So and she was able to be part of what they call the American Dream Program, which was done by one lender, um, which is a nice program where she got in for very little money down. And because of the fact, but my point to you is don't think that when you go through a short sale foreclosure or whatever, you're never going to be able to get back in the market. You will, as long as you take the proper steps to get yourself back in the market. But a lot of people, Barry, um, were young, but a lot of people were old who got affected by this type of what they call predatory lending. Okay. So, so, so my, my, my question is that what are the advantages of buying foreclosed properties? The advantage, if there is uh, any advantage, the, there is, and like I said earlier, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, you can buy the property for a lower value. But Barry, the problem is this: is that if you don't know that the work you're going to have to do to it, um, and what you're going to take to get it done, if you don't have the cash and the equity, you're you're you're, you're going to be in trouble. If you don't have the understanding and knowledge, unless you have a family member who understands it or, or a friend who can help you out through it. Um, and, and walk you through. So the advantage is that it's what I call sweat equity. If you can get in, you can build it, you can make more money because you're buying at a lower value and you're taking sweat equity to build up to get it to the value where it can be, where you can make, you can make a good chunk of money, okay? But the foreclosure market is there, but it's not like it was, but we are seeing some uptick in certain areas of the country in foreclosures, um, but we're not seeing it in other areas. But the advantages are you can make some money. And the advantage of buying short sales is you can make some money if you know what you're doing. Also, there are disadvantages, right? Uh, disadvantages of area, the biggest piece. Hmm. The, 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 the biggest piece is, is, is buying something and not knowing how to finish it, not knowing how to complete the project. As I told you earlier, when I talk talking about a first-time buyer, when a first-time buyer is buying, looking to buy a home, they have a roadmap. Like you said, you need to figure out where you need to go. But that person who's buying that REO property, that foreclosure, needs to figure out where, they, where they're trying to go. Great. So what is the difference between a condo, multifamily, and single family? <laughs> well, Barry, it's funny to ask that question. Single family is just a single family where, you know, it's just where one family lives. Some single families have what they call in-law apartments, where they have their in-laws live downstairs or an apartment for, uh, for, for, for their college student or whatever. No, that's called the in-law, but it's still a single family. Um, then you have what they call a multifamily. Multifamily is where you have multiple people living in one actual structure. Now, as we have here in Massachusetts and, and parts of the East Coast, where we have three families and two families, and then they also have multi these huge buildings which are also known as multi-family uh, units uh three family is when you have three units inside the building two family of course is two units and then the multi units are when they have multiple units inside of the building um and the thing is with that is that there are multiple different families living in it now you asked me about condos it's funny because what we're seeing and we've been seeing for the longest time it is, it's not a new phenomenon, but where people are taking multifamilies and turning them into condos. Condos are when you actually live in the unit. So let's just give you an example. There's a three family that was converted to a condo. So three units that used to be a multi. And if someone takes and converts them, and what happens is each person who buys just that floor, but it's, if it's three units, they each own one third of the building, meaning one third of the outside, one third of the, of, 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 of the uh, driveway, one third of everything the stairs, but that does not mean that, that they only fix up one third of it. What it is, Barry, is that they turn around and they come to what they call an association and all that money they put in the association goes together and helps take care of the maintenance. But what they actually do is they own the interior and one half in between the wall and the outside of the wall, they own that, okay? Unless inside the condo deeds a restriction that it's different and what it states is what they actually own. So they have to, you have to dig down into the condos 
condo docs to understand exactly what you own, but that is the basic premise. So when looking for a real estate agent to work with, what are some of the things, of a realtor, I would say, uh, what are some of the things you want to know about them? Um, you know, what are some of the things you want to know about that real estate agent or that realtor? Uh, you just want to know if they're knowledgeable. Um, you want to know if they're trustworthy. You want to know if, if they have your back. You, you, want, to, you want to know that, 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 that you can actually talk to them and tell them what you're thinking and they'll listen. That's the most important thing, Larry. Are they listening to you as the consumer? Are they really making sure that, that, that they're, they're advocating for your rights as a consumer? That's the most important thing. Even when you're buying and selling your home, your agent got to be able to do that. You know, your agent can say, well, I did all this and I've done this and I've done this and I got all that. You know, accolades are one thing. Um, but, you know, the other piece is really being that agent, being really truly listened to you. That's really, really important. Does that make sense? Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. So let's talk about uh, a newly certified real estate agent. Newly certified real estate agent. Interesting. So let's say uh, they got their real estate license, but they they put it in an inactive mode because they're not ready to be full-time real estate agent. Can they still refer someone to a real estate person and get a referral fee or in other words, get a commission? Well, in the state of Massachusetts, this is the funny piece that you, if you have a real estate license and you did not take the continuing education classes, but, you've actually kept it in what they call an inactive mode, but you've paid the fee to keep it in an inactive mode. You then can turn around and send out referrals to an agent and get an actual referral check sent to you. Now, the funny thing is, if you go ahead and have a license, you take the continuing education classes, you then have to turn around and put your license with somebody for you to be able to obtain an actual referral fee, meaning you have to put your license with an actual broker or an or, you know, broker, a broker agent, a broker company, okay, to do that. So let me re reiterate that one more time. If you don't take the continuing education classes, but you pay the fee to keep your license, but keep put it in an inactive status, you can send out referrals and get a natural check given to you directly but if you go ahead and have your license take the continuing education credit then turn around pay the fee you then have to take your license and have to hang it with an actual agency for you to obtain an actual referral fee ironically the other day i was just sitting with the executive director of the Master Association of Realtors, and I ran this by him. He just shook my head and I said, I get this whole concept, but you know, and we just we went into it. But that's that's the loophole where people would have to but you gotta remember you have must have paid your fee to the Massachusetts Association of Licensing Real Estate Licensing Board for you to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. That was <laughs> perfect. So now what piece of advice can you give to someone who wants to become a real estate agent? Make sure you have some money put away. Make sure you're not getting in this business just because you watched HGTV and saw a million dollar listing and all that. So oh, I can make a bunch of money because right now, and I just found this out um, here in Massachusetts, we have over 90,000 people who actually have had a real estate license in the state of Massachusetts. Now that does not mean that they've actually paid the fee to remain inactive. So they're not an actual real estate agent, but they've taken their license. Now do we have now to talk about those who have paid the fee to have a real estate license to be a real estate agent is about thirty six thousand that they can actually say that they've actually paid the fee to be inactive or have paid the fee to, to do the continuing education to do whatever. So I, I say all that is that you have, a, you, have a, you have a bunch of competition out there. So understand that this is not an easy business. And you as the brand new agent, 
need to really dig down deep and say, am I going to do this? And do I have at least three to six months worth of money put to the side? And do I have my database put together? Meaning, do you have your, 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 all your aunts and uncles and your friends and family, and you have their phone numbers, their email addresses? Do you have all that put together? That's number one. Number two, do you have a network of people that, that you can possibly tap on? And don't always think that your family's going to be the one who's going to go to you first. Your family's not always the first one to go to you. Okay? You're going to have to prove yourself out there. So you're going to have to figure out how do you do that. The other thing is that understand when you get in this business, make sure you understand that you understand how to write up offers, okay? Understand that you understand how the offer is submitted. Understand how the transaction goes from beginning to end, like I explained earlier, in regards to going from what the buyer needs to do and also understand what the seller needs to do and how to prepare the seller to sell their home. Understand all that. Also, understand that when you get in this business, that you have to, understand, you have to learn dialogues and scripts. You have to understand that and be very well versed about what you say and how you say it. It's important that you do that. Once you've been able to do all that, okay, as a new agent, understand you have a lot to do and you have to be committed to this business and don't think it's just that, that tomorrow you get a sale and you're gonna to continue to get sales. No, this business, every single day you come to work, you have to hunt. You have to hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt until you actually grab onto it, until you can take it home and bury it and put it in the ground and then, then you go ahead and eat it and cook it later. I use that, I use that, you know, because that's what this business is. This is a constant game of chasing down leads and constantly being in front of people and constantly reinventing yourself so that you can become the best agent. Also being willing to be able to get yourself educated at all times. Educate yourself in this business because this business has so many different facets, okay, and it can move left to right and it's very fluid if you understand how it actually works. You know, so there's a lot of things that I could get into, but that's what the agent, you're the first time agent, really has to dig down deep and figure out if this is what they want. What keeps you motivated? Very, what keeps me motivated is learning something new all the time. What keeps me motivated is always trying to figure out how I can be better and how I can bring my knowledge to anybody who wants it. May it be a local consumer, may it be a real estate agent, may it be my office, May it, may it be anybody who wants or needs something. That's what keeps me motivated. Don't get me wrong. I have highs and lows like everybody else. I go through down times. I go through good times. I have times that are absolutely wonderful and things are flying through the, through the world. And I can't complain about that. But Barry, you know, it's really important that, that, that you have to understand that, that you're going to have these times. And sometimes you're going to pull out books. Sometimes you're going to... Um, do some uh, audio tapes. Sometimes you gotta just get around positive people. I tell people all the time, get rid of the negativity in your life and you will see things change. Don't get me wrong, we all go through bad things, but don't let that bad thing hold you down. You have the right to let that bad thing hold you down for a while, but once you realize what that bad thing is, shed it and keep it moving. We're all, every single one of us have family issues. Every single one of us have 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 have, have 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 issues going on with inside ourselves, with going in an office, everything else. But understand, those things will always be there, always. But guess what? You can mentally make the shift, but you have to be willing to make the shift. You have to also be willing to understand what is going on and why is it happening to you. Okay, you have to understand, sometimes you have to take blame on yourself and understand you might have been the cause of the problem. Don't always think that everybody else is always the problem, okay? Sometimes it's inside you. It's within six inches, Barry, five to six inches causes half the problems in your life. You know what those, between those five to six inches are? Your ears. Between your ears is where most of the problem happens. That head, okay, it's right between here. If you mentally are geared up, you're good. You know what I mean? And, yeah. that. and we have to understand that. So, you know, what keeps me going is knowing that I can keep going. What also keeps me going is looking out there. But I don't look at the Instagrams, okay? I do look at them, but I'm looking at them like, oh, I wish I was like that. I could. No, I don't look at, you know, I need to be famous. I need to be having a million-dollar mansion. I need to be sitting up all this. That's not what motivates me. It's not. Some people, money does motivate them, and that's good, and money's important. Okay, 
But what motivates me is making sure that I did the right thing by everybody and myself. But mainly, I did the right thing by myself to make sure that I help others become better. Because if I help others become better, I become better. And you know, Barry, it's funny because I've dealt with a lot of people who are selfish. And you know, it's funny how things come around. I just had someone, I did something for them. And ironically, Barry, they came and called me almost two years later and said, hey, we got to sit down and have lunch. We got to talk. Why? Because they realized what I did for them was so important and it it catapulted them to a certain level that they realized that I was the instrument to help it happen. And I appreciate them making that phone call. I appreciate them calling me because, Barry, I try the best that I can do for anybody. I don't have an evil bone in my body. Okay, it's one thing. I may get upset. I may be a little pissed for a little while, but I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm here to make sure that I help. And that's what motivates me and keeps me moving. So where were you born again, uh, Mr. Vera? I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Where are your parents from? Uh, So my mother was born here in Boston as well. My father was born in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, my last name is Vieira, um, ironically. Uh, the crazy thing about it is, is that my, my, my father was named after a gentleman by the name of John Vieira, but his real father was named Jimmy Guilford. So before I end this show, uh, Mr. Vera, um, I have a segment called Share Something About Yourself, where I ask uh, my guests uh, personal questions. So what is your biggest, what is your biggest fear? You know, Barry, you asked that question, but the crazy thing is I lost my sister going on two years come May of this year. And, you know, that was probably one of my biggest fear was losing my sister. I lost my mother 20 years ago. I lost my sister 21 years ago. Lost both of them to cancer. So what is your preferred color? I like blue. (laughs) I like blue. What, Um, What is your, what is your favorite book? You know what I like is who moves the cheese, but it's a very quick read and it makes you think because what happens is it's it's basically a concept of a mouse being in a maze and every time the cheese gets moved and the mouse figure out how to get to it, figure out how to get around it and there's many obstacles that are put in the way of that mouse and basically it just tells you in life there's going to be many obstacles that are put in your way and how do you get around those obstacles and how do you make the best of it and don't get frustrated. So that's basic, the basic concept. So that that that's interesting. Um, so great, great. Hey, Melvin, uh, thank you for a great interview. Thank you for sharing all this great information. Not, not a problem. I have one more thing. If I can add one more thing. Um, yeah, go ahead. Real quick, uh, I I do this program called. Uh, I'm a facilitator for a program called Urban Land Institute. And what this program does for me being a facilitator, Urban Land Institute, ULI, ULI ULI.org, this organization is one of the very first organizations that's brought into any kind of major project that's done in any kind of major city throughout the world. They bring these, they bring a bunch of professionals who are architects, maybe lawyers, financiers, real estate agents, um, planners, uh, environmentalists, they bring them all together. And what happens is anybody's thinking about doing any kind of large projects in those areas, um, they bring this company in and they do a consulting for them. And basically, we're, we're an organization that's a national, a worldwide organization. And what, what they do is, the, uh, say the city council, or the governor, or the president, or someone will ask, hey, what if I put this in the area, how feasible will it be? And they sit down and they come together and they collaborate what will work for that area. I say all that because I'm a facilitator for the schools here in Boston. And what I've been doing lately is been going over to the schools because I've been teaching in certain certain Boston public schools, um, teaching these classes so these young men and women get an understanding of how these actual buildings or how these actual areas are being planned and developed and why certain buildings are going in certain areas and why like a target will go in with, with, with the units above. And what they do is they give these children a budget and they give them a uh, they give them an RFP if they have to read and tells them how much money they're going to get, how much they're going to sell the land for, and they give them an actual uh, rate of return they need to give to the developer and also a rate of return they need to give to the actual, um, to, to, the, to the city council. And I go in 
periodically to the school room and after teachers have taught had the kids do the thing then i would go and, and be like a, a, another set of eyes to look at the plan what they're trying to do and and give them some thought-provoking questions to help them kind of think about how to change the plan and what makes sense so you know we give them historic buildings we give them a, a homeless shelter we give them uh, uh skyscrapers we give them office buildings and they all have a certain price point how much it costs and we tell them how much uh low to moderate housing we need to have in there affordable housing we need to have we tell them how much storefront we need to do we tell them if they get rid of the building they have to pay a certain amount of money to develop a fee to get rid of the building you know, so we give them the real life scenarios how would they have to do and we also tell them talk about the traffic count and talk about if they open up if they have a major uh part if they have a, a driveway space basically how much congestion it may cause in the street and talk about the, the train system and the school, you know, so we do the whole thing with them. And then what happens is I go back in on the third visit as the city council, and then they have to present their plan. Then there'll be five teams that present their plans to us about what they're trying to do. And, we sh and they are trying to get the city council to decide which is the best plan for them to come up with it, you know, for us to take on. And it's not always about the money. It's not about the profit. It's about a lot of different things when we decide on what we're going to do and how, what, what proposal we're going to take. And they come up and they literally have to, to design a proposal, an actual color proposal with, with the financials on it, with the structure, talking about the structure, talking about them and their, 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 their bios. Cause each one of them get in that. They're like, they're either the marketing director. They're the site plan director, they're the uh, city council liaison, they're the neighborhood liaison, or they're the financial planner. And each one of them have their roles and they have to talk about who they are and why they work. And then when they present it, they have to present it in their roles to us. I say all this to you is because this type of program is, is I find it very, very inspirational for me, but I also find it very insightful for these young men and women because you can see and teach our young leaders today about why certain things are being developed in certain neighborhoods and when certain things are being done in certain neighborhoods and it's a true story one of the young ladies who went through this class a project was being done and it was around her church and she was just basically 19 years old she had just went through it through high school and the church and the community was like we don't understand this she goes ah. she raised her hand she goes i do so they actually put it in her lap to help them facilitate for them in her community to run it. And she was only 19 years old, but she learned this skill in school. So, and she was able to help the elders and what they call the NIMBYs, not in my backyard, to understand why certain things happen because she had already done that program. So I say so all this what, to you. What is, what is, can you repeat uh, that, um, the website for that program again? Well, the organization is called ULI, uh, which is ULI. U, yep, U as an umbrella, L as in Larry, I as in igloo, ULI.org. You can go on there and the ULI is, I belong to the association, but we have a whole piece in there, which we're now embedding into the school systems. There's like 11 school systems throughout the, throughout the United States that have, have taken on and allowed us to come in and, and teach these classes or help facilitate these classes with inside there. In their, and Massachusetts has about nine schools right now. I'm trying to push it so that I can get it done throughout the rest of the city of Boston as well, especially within the inner cities. I'm going to try to push it as much as I can so that it gets pushed with inside of the majority of these inner city schools because these young men and women don't realize that you don't have to be a real estate license. You don't have to, see this. You have to be a real estate agent. You can do many different things in the real estate industry by doing these things. So you could be an architect, okay, which is still involved in the real estate industry. You could be a person who's a financier who's in the real estate industry. You can be the engineer and a planner. You no, know, you can do different things within it. And that's what this class actually teaches these men and women, young men and women, that they can do anything with inside the real estate industry, but but you don't only just don't think selling real estate is the end all be all. You can be the developer, you can be the builder, you know what I mean? You can do whatever, you can be the marketing director. So anyway, I just wanted to bring great. that to you. Great information, great information. All right, sir. Thank you very All right, much. Sir, take care. All right, see All right, you. Right. Yeah, have a good one. Yep, yeah, bye-bye. All right, bye. All right. Thanks to my guest, Melvin Vieira. Thanks to you for listening. Visit his website at www.propertiesforsaleinboston.com.
The Barry Media Show takes you places that you have never imagined. You can find me on Instagram at Barry Medias and on Twitter at Barry Medias. Thank you once again. See you next time. Mm-hmm.